Uh, hello, good morning, my friends. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Meng. Uh, for those who know me, my name is still Meng. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm the jolly good fellow, uh, which nobody can deny. <laughs> Uh, it's my honor today to introduce a fellow jolly good fellow, uh, <laughs> Matthew Ricard. <laughs> now, Matthew is a very gifted scientist who became a Buddhist monk. Uh, he was regarded as one of the most promising scientists of his generation. Oh, yeah. oh sorry, biologist. Yeah, modern, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I took that from the web. <laughs> he completed his PhD thesis in 1972 before like, most of you were born. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to join Google at that time. <laughs> so, so he went to Nepal instead and became a biologist. No, just kidding. He became a monk. <laughs> and he has lived and uh, studied in the Himalayas for the past 35 years, where he has been doing uh, humanitarian projects. Uh, Matthew is also a best-selling author. He's a translator and he's a photographer. And all these pictures, they are taken by him. Uh, he's also an active participant in current scientific research on meditation and the brain. And in many of those studies, he is the brain that, that they're studying. When, when you were in high school, did people call you the brain? <laughs> okay. If they did, it, they'll be right. <laughs> so Matthew is a very happy man. He is so happy, he wrote an entire book on happiness. <laughs> and and he, he autographed my book, so, so I'm very happy. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Matthew is one of the most fascinating men I've ever met in my life, and I he meet only a, met me once. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I meet a lot of famous people. Yeah, you guys know that. <laughs> and it's it's an honor and pleasure for me to welcome Matthew Ricard into our presence. You know, just to go on about for those who don't know him and those who know him, there's also an interesting story. Of a, of a Middle East wise man called Mullah Nasruddin. Maybe many of you could know him. And once he came into a coffee shop and went straight to the owner and asked him, did you see me enter? And the guy said, yes. And then he asked, but do you know me? And the guy said, no. Then how do you know it's me? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. It's a pleasure to visit this wonderfully enjoyable place where you meet people in swimming trunk with the, with the <laughs> moving in the alleys, going to the swimming pool. And uh, occasionally, Meng says he leaves his massage chair to go to, this, to his office. <laughs> so definitely, I would like to work there. And it seems better than being at home. So probably, I have nothing to. Uh, to teach you about happiness. And uh, someone told me, actually, I should never have written this book because I never suffered very much in my life. So this is the last person to write a book on happiness and suffering. So anyway, um, I thought to just share a few ideas because they were very dear to me. And uh, uh, they brought a lot of sense of fulfillment and joy to be alive and a sense of direction in life. And this came through meeting beings of great wisdom. It sort of started like that. You know, when we speak of leadership, leadership has to be someone who somehow inspires you by showing you the kind of potential that you could actualize, showing you what you could become, and giving you a sense of direction and inspiration. That's not very frequent in life. You know, I was quite lucky in my teens to be born in a family in France where my father was a well-known philosopher, so we had all these great thinkers and poets at home. My mother was an artist, so we had all these you know, surrealist painters and all that coming. Uh, because of my, some musical connections, when I was 16 years old, uh, I had lunch with Stravinsky himself, you know, just for two hours with three people all together. And um, I had an uncle who was an explorer. He went around the world on a sailboat without an engine after the Second World War. And he had all kinds of eccentric friends, such as one when we went to see him in Paris, and there was a small note on his door saying, I, I left on foot for Tombouctou, and things like that. <laughs> so a lot of wonderful people. And in science, of course, the lab I was working with, with two, three Nobel Prize of medicine, Jacob, Mono, and Wolf at Pasteur Institute. So it was very exciting, very, there was led, definitely a lot of 
uh, people to look at as, you know, what, what could I do? Where could I be inspired? At the same time, definitely I would have wished to play the piano, you know, like Stratoslav Richter or the chess like Bobby Fischer, but I don't know if you remember about Bobby Fischer, but who wants to become Bobby Fischer? <laughs> so there was a kind of discrepancy. You know, you could take 100 gardeners, you would have a number of wonderful people, and some gardeners, you know, quite short temper and not so nice to deal with. But same thing with philosophers, same thing with scientists, same thing with artists. No matter what their particular skill or genius was, there was no correlation as such between their human qualities and their particular genius. So you could try to pick up all the things and make your own salad and try to, but that somehow didn't seem a bit artificial like making a pulse of all that and thinking it's going to work. So then I was lucky enough to travel to the Himalayas, and then I met something quite different, sort of men of wisdom, men and women and wisdom. And what was a bit special about them, you know, they are all the great Tibetan teachers who have fled the, uh, the invasion of Tibet uh, towards India and other places, is I didn't really care so much what they knew in terms of no, poetry, Tibetan grammar, and even Buddhist philosophy in the beginning. That was not my, my interest at all. Uh, but what they were, that was inspiring. The, the quality, the human quality. And then I thought, you know, I want to become like them, not just know what they know. And so because there was a kind of, uh, the first trigger was seeing a documentary movie on those great teachers that someone, a friend of mine, made for the French television. And at the end of the, the, the documentary, there was a five-minute silent segment, one face of those meditators and hermits and spiritual teacher and the Dalai Lama, one after the other, just like silent. It was so powerful. It was like 20 Socrates or 20 you know, San Francisco of Assisi, whoever you feel like is represent the wisdom of humanity, just there alive in our time. So I said, well, I should go to see. And then that was very interesting because somehow someone like that, and I'm going to show some images, show you what you could become. It's a source of inspiration. Give you a, that this is possible. You know, some, somebody made it somehow. Then of course you get interested in how, but first you have to see that it's, uh, it makes sense. And so also, in the course of living in the Himalayas, I know after a while traveling back and forth, some of the things became quite clear about what brings a little more fulfillment in life. And it seems that we so much put our hopes and fears in the outer conditions. So now, let's be clear from the beginning, it's, it's, we want the outer conditions to be optimal compared to 150 years ago, where the life expectancy, even in Europe, was like 30 years. And who doesn't want to live long, to be healthy, to have access to education, to have a wonderful working place, harmonious human relations in one's family, with friends, with people, live in a country where there is peace, where there is a, not an oppressive regime. So all that, we, we, we really deeply sort of yearn for that, and that's right. And we have to to develop that to the maximum we can to, and especially in a world where there's far from being granted for many, many places of the world where 3,000 children still die every day of malaria and all, all that you know. And there's so much to do just to bring those minimum outer condition. Yet, it's quite clear too that if we only put our hopes and fears in the outer world, we it's not going to work in our search for, for, for direction, for meaning, for a genuine sense of fulfillment and accomplishment, what we would call genuine happiness. Genuine happiness doesn't mean pleasant feelings, one after the other, each one more and more intense, piling them up, renewing them, seeking them, and then f collapsing out exhaustion at the end. So that's not going to work. So it's more like a, a cluster of qualities that we can develop as skills, like, you know, openness, genuine altruistic love, compassion, inner strength, some kind of inner peace. And then that gives you a sense of confidence that's not just like a, the, the false confidence of arrogance, but confidence that 
you are less vulnerable and therefore more ready also to, to be of service of others and contribute to uh, a more compassionate and, and society that gives you better way of, of flourishing yourself and others. And because less, more confidence means less feeling of insecurity, of fears, then more readiness to be there for others. So it's quite clear that the outer condition themselves are not enough, however necessary or useful they might be. Not enough because we also can clearly see that our state of mind, the way we interpret and translate those outer conditions in our inner sort of uh, experience, are what really determines states of well-being and or misery. And the state of mind can easily override those outer conditions. We can be, feel terrible in a little paradise, and we can feel still very strong and joyful and wish to go about one's life and contribute to the happiness of others, even in the face of adversity. And uh, so as the Dalai Lama once gave this striking example, if you move in a you know, very luxurious flat at the 100th floor of a high-tech skyscraper for the first time, you just bought it, and then you are totally ruined within, destroyed in your, in your heart, in your mind, all you are going to look for is a window from which to jump. On the other hand, you could have this great joy to be alive and uh, empathy, whatever, all those human qualities, even, you know, when outer conditions doesn't seem nice at all, but because your state of mind is stronger. And that's a such fortunate situation. Because imagine that to find happiness, the world will have to be the image of your desire, your fancies, that the universe will be a vast catalog in which you could order all the ingredients for happiness. Forget it. You know, it's never going to happen like that. There, is, there should be six billion catalogs, and everyone will choose different items, and they will never work. So, but, you know, this is not just a, it seems obvious, but great thinkers thought otherwise. Immanuel Kant wrote that complete happiness will be the complete fulfillment of all our desires in quantity, quality, and duration. No, just the whole idea of happiness goes to the drain. This will never happen, <laughs> never. How can that be? And anyway, impermanence is there. Even you had for a fraction of a second everything to be happy. Then one piece was going to be missing the next day. So again, collapse. So it doesn't work. And we know in real life, I remember once going to Tahiti with the young abbot of my monastery. It was the first of two Buddhist monks in Tahiti. It was big news. So in the in the in the it's going now? Okay. No? Yes. So in the evening news, there was two big items. They found a snake in the forest. There's no snake in Tahiti. And second item, two Buddhist monks arrived in Tahiti. <laughs> so the next day, we were at this wonderful, like, postcard-looking sunset in Paul Gauguin's house. And, uh, well, he was not there. But uh, <laughs> in a very beautifully lit swimming pool, and sitting there, and then looking at each other and saying, oh, is that, if we are the owner of that, it's supposed to make us happy? There seems to be no relation. And then if that makes us happy, then what? If we double the size of the swimming pool, we're twice as much happy? So of course, no, no, no relation. It's the way you interpret things. And we are the confirmation of that about the way of interpreting the world the next morning, because you know, Tahiti looks great on postcards, um, uh, uh, but it's pretty hot and damn wet when you are there. So we were sitting on a beautiful tree, and there was, imagine, there was this kind of soft sort of mist, refreshing mist falling from the tree. And we're sitting there, like complete bliss, thinking, well, this is real paradise. You know, even the trees are conditioned. <laughs> but then someone came and said, you know, those are pissing flies. <laughs> so our perception of the world changed right away. <laughs> so now. So let's assume that the inner conditions for well-being are really what will determine the quality of everything that goes by. 
and that's fair assumption. But then, that's where I'm in a much better position, because that's our mind, the final experiencer of that. At least we are not having to modify the whole world to our taste. But we can change our mind. If we change our mind, we change our world. That's the world we experience. So that's the idea. So for that, we need to identify which conditions in our mind are leading to a sense of fulfillment, uh, m sort of fruition, accomplishment, and sense that we, if we look 20, 20 years in, uh, ahead, if we look back, we see that somehow that's the best we could do with our capacities, and we chose the right direction, something that's really truly meaningful in our life. So what are those conditions which will nurture that quality? Also the quality of every moment that passes, because after, after all, life is not just remembering the past and projecting in the future. That's the quality of the present moment. That's what the day is made of. As someone says, take care of the minutes, the hours will take care of themselves. So if all the minutes are unhappy, how could the hours and day somehow be fulfilled? So we need that quality. So that has to do with states of mind. And then there are states of mind which are totally detrimental to the quality of, of that life. Like hatred, resentment, grudge, nagging jealousy, obsessive desire, sort of arrogance. All those are just makes you feel miserable. And of course, they also induce you to act and speak in ways that also cause suffering around you. So it's a lose-lose situation that comes to very self-centered, you know, excessive, excessive feeling of self-importance, bringing everything to oneself, and trying to build up a so-called selfish happiness, sometimes at the detriment of others' well-being. That's absolutely not going to work. If, if a selfish happiness is the goal of your life, then that life is soon going to be without any goal, because that simply cannot work. The reason it cannot work is that excessive preoccupation with oneself is a constant source of torment and feeling, being vulnerable to everything. Criticism, and praise, and failure, and success. All those will take disproportionate sort of importance, will be like a storm in a glass of water. And that's, each of those will be like small balls bouncing in that small, tiny bubble of the, of the ego, and then hurting you every time. So we need to let that explode, that, that self-centeredness bubble, and let those bullets let's lose in the vast space of open-minded, and uh, so that we not just simply obsess with this, what's going to happen to me, how do I feel, and all these things that is just a way of uh, is buying trouble for ourselves. So now there are other type of emotions and mental state which definitely we feel as something that is nourishing the sense of well-being, like, say, loving kindness, unconditional love, wanting to an act of generosity with no strings attached, just a mere wish of bringing some happiness or relieve some suffering to others, and some sense of inner peace, inner strength, inner kind of contentment. So all those together makes it a way of being. And that's what genuine happiness is. It's not just the pleasant feelings and trying to you know, accumulate them endlessly. Because pleasant feelings are so much fleeting. Even you try to renew them, they depend upon circumstances, upon time. Uh, they change in nature um, from one moment to the other. Something that's very pleasant, you know, like a chocolate cake, one serving is great, two. Three, you become nauseous. So the same thing as change of nature. The most beautiful music you can dream of, you might, if you are really hooked onto it, listen three, four times at a row. But imagine 24 hours nonstop. What a fatigue. You, it doesn't work. And also, it is something that somehow is, is so centered upon oneself. You can experience intense sensation of pleasure if everyone is suffering even at the cost of other making suffer, is not something that is inspiring necessarily, and is so vulnerable to change. No. Way, the happiness as a way of being, as an optimal sort of way of, of the mind to be, will 
remain throughout the ups and downs, throughout the different emotional states, and give you the resources to deal with whatever comes. So rather than being dependent on the fluctuating changes of ups and downs of life, that's what gives you the resources to deal with those changing conditions. It's like the depth of the ocean is always there compared to the change of the surface, where there's sometimes storms, sometimes beautiful weather. But if you don't, don't have the depth, then you are in the midst of that weather change of the surface with nothing to refer to. So it is a, a way of being. And as a, or a manner of being. But manners need to be learned. It's not granted. Yet we, it is true that we more or less born with the kind of traits we are more or less happy and extrovert kids or kids which are a little bit more violent and some others are very sweet and will give their toys to others. So we have traits, but no, those are just blueprints. Uh, this is not the time to elaborate on that, but epigenesis means that even you have this set of, of genes, at any time they, there's something that could regulate their expression. They, that wonderful study is now done showing that almost any kind of gene that determines traits can be modified by the environment, by receiving and giving love and tenderness. It can, the gene can be for stress, for instance, can be blocked for life if there's a strong component of tenderness in very early in life. And so those are just sort of potential that we are more or less sort of gifted in the beginning, but sort of the hard work and the interaction can change that. So there's, there is this flexibility in everything, in, in the genes, in the way we experience the world. So there is ma margin to, to change. And not only that, but by which kind of mystery our mind and the way we experience things would just change towards happiness just because we wish to be happy? Everything else in life we need to learn. We need to, when we're born, this un, 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 unidentified crying object cannot speak, cannot walk, can do nothing, will die in a few days if the mother wasn't there to, to, with great love and care to make it, make that, that newborn baby be alive and learn and learn experience of life and so, and so forth. And then everything in our life, like uh, going to school, learning a, a profession, uh, the b building human relationship, all that comes with, with learning, with uh, like emotional skills are, are sort of learned by experience. So how come that the, the most f fundamental thing that determines the quality of our life, we just come just like that? So we, need, we have to understand that we usually underestimate the power of transformation of mind. We think that this, so this is just life. You know, we are like that. This is the human nature to be this mixture of light, of shadows, quality, and defect. And actually, that's desirable. It will be terribly boring not to have jealousy or strong passion, even the tear us apart, you know, that's exciting. And uh, Goethe wrote that three days of uninterrupted happiness will be so boring. It's always the same. My suffering is so vibrant. It always changes, you know, so exciting. But you know, is it true? Are we just saying that to justify the fact that we are not quite sure how to change that? And then we try to make a philosophy to fit with that state of affairs. Because in truth, you know, when you are sitting maybe in a beautiful garden or somewhere by a lake and with someone you love or just like enjoying the beauty of nature and feeling in harmony with the world, with others, with yourself, with less inner conflict, working in the snow under the stars or something like that, and feel really at peace, are you going to regret the tense atmosphere of the emergency room of a, of a, of a hospital or something? Or if I come now when you're sitting peacefully and say, please get angry right now, you say, well, why should I, you know, I'm fine. Or would you like to spend the whole afternoon being terribly jealous? You say, no, why? Wow, this doesn't sound such a nice prospect. <laughs> but if I say, well, would you like to spend the next two, three hours you know, having compassion or loving kindness as the main sort of state of mind present in, in, in yourself? You say, wow, that seems pretty neat. You know? So you, the, we feel instinctively that even though we can't escape for, for the time being those kind of different kinds of mental toxins that we'd rather be well off without them. But now is it possible to change that? Because we might say it's so deeply intrinsic to human nature that we can't do anything. So yes, in a way, it is in human nature in the sense we all have those positive and negative emotions. So in that sense, it is part of human nature. 
But to be part of something, there are different ways of being part of something. You could be part of something of like the, the whiteness of the screen that's all over the, the texture of the screen. And to remove that, you would have to destroy the screen. But this is also somehow part of the screen. It's there on the screen, but it doesn't penetrate the screen, doesn't belong to the screen, doesn't remain to the screen. And the screen allows it to appear, yet it is not modified as such. But it allows it to appear. So that's the key. So in order for all the mental states, mental constructs to arise in our mind, whether positive emotions or negative ones, no matter, there has to be some kind of basic screen, or like the light. If I show a torch light to shine on you, the light can show or in the garden beautiful flowers or maybe a, a pile of garbage. So you might say, this is beautiful, this is ugly. The light allows you to see that, but the light doesn't become beautiful or ugly. The light is what makes that perceptible, visible. Likewise, at the fundamental aspect of cognition or the mind, we call that the bare consciousness or the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, pure awareness. It is a kind of basic cognitive factor. And, and I think meditators can introspectively sort of experience that behind the screen of thoughts, this kind of pure aware presence. Uh, we call that the luminous aspect of, ma of mind in Buddhist term. Luminous, not that it glows in the dark, or like the, the, those Google things shooting from the earth, but that it is luminous compared to a dark object like this tool with no cognitive quality whatsoever. So it is luminous, it's, 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 cognit it's cognizant. So now that is not tainted by hatred, jealousy, and so forth. It allows that to occur, but it's, it cannot be. If hatred was so intrinsically part, then hatred should shine on everything. Like if the light was beautiful in itself, everything will be beautiful when you shine the light on something, or ugly, whatever. So that's not the case. So that gives margin, because those mental constructs are a result of causes and conditions. So it gives, you can modify those causes and conditions, and that's the principle of mind training. And that's what meditation is about. Meditation has many meanings, but the root, the actual literal meaning is in Sanskrit, bhavana means to cultivate. And in, in Tibetan, gom means to be familiar with something, to become familiar with a new way of being, with new qualities, with a, a perception of the world that is more attuned with reality, not seeing the world as solid, autonomous, permanent objects, but as a, as a dynamic sort of flux interdependent of ceaselessly changing causes and conditions, even our consciousness is a stream, a dynamic stream constantly changing. And so if we, it also to develop qualities like compassion and loving kindness. So meditation is really to cultivate something. It can be to cultivate inner calm to begin with, like let the, to, to mindful breathing, to let the thoughts subside a little bit, and through not being caught in that constant whirlpool, then from that state we can develop those qualities like compassion and loving kindness. So it is something that needs to be trained, and everything has to be learned. Otherwise, this spoiled brat of our mind is going to continue to run over the place. And then this, you know, we have this mixture of constant joy and torments, and so we can do much better. We say that's normal, but normal state is just a pandemic. It's, we are all so much like that that we think it's normal. But optimal is something else, and we, this is possible. So we can use all kinds of methods, and techniques. That's what the sort of the, the methodology or the science, or the contemplative science is about using antidotes, for instance. Antidote means there are things one-to-one -one that are mutually exclusive. You cannot, in the same gesture, stretch your hand friendly way and give a blow. You cannot, in the same moment of thought, want to harm someone and want to do good. So it's very simple, but if you think of that, the more you'll bring, say, altruistic thoughts, thought of benevolence in your mind, the less, at those moments, there will be space for malevolence, harmful thoughts, and so forth. So if you can imagine that, yes, we do feel moments of love and moments of resentment, but we don't cultivate them. We don't try to generate loving kindness and just keep it flowing in our mind and remaining it and feeding it and sort of preserving it for like five, 10 minutes. It's not something we do. But that's what we need to do if we want to become that more part of our mind. If we want to change our minute-to-minute -minute emotions and moods and then finally traits, that's how we learn. 
You don't learn skiing by doing it 15 seconds every week. You have to do it a certain time. It, it won't happen without a minimum of sort of dedication. And to dedicate oneself to something and find the time for it, we need to see the advantages of doing so. And in case of changing one's mind, advantages are quite obvious. There are many other ways, but just to give you a quick example uh, of, for instance, anger. And by anger, here I mean a malevolent anger, not indignation in the face of uh, injustice or, or massacre or something, but the anger that really has a component of wishing to harm. And also, when we are in, invaded by this, we are one with anger. We cannot see anything else. We see the other person, object of our anger, as 100% despicable. We can't see any quality in that person. And we completely associate with this anger, even though a few, years, a few hours later we might say, you know, I was out of myself, I was no more myself. We know there's something that was quite, it's like having the flu. You know, we, you are not the flu, but flu sort of grips you. But then we could do something else. Instead of being obsessed by the trigger, we could look, try to dissociate and look at anger, gaze at it, the raw sensation and feeling and emotion of anger, not the the, the, the causes and circumstances that, that create it, because that's the fuel, that's the wood that you had constantly on the fire. But look at the fire itself, forget about the wood. If you do so, the fire cannot maintain itself very long. Anger cannot sustain itself on its own. It's just bound to vanish. It melts away like the morning frost under the rising sun. And that's a very skillful way of dealing, because it avoids two extremes that do not work. One is venting anger. When people say you should break pianos and all these kind of things to feel better when you are angry. It doesn't work. It makes you more and more angry. You get angry easily and more often. Or keeping it as a time bomb somewhere in the back of your mind, and then again, it's, it doesn't work. So now here you have, for the time being, solved the problem. You dealt with it. It vanished away. There's no trace for the time being. It might come back, but you start again. So instead of venting it or keeping it, which will reinforce the tendency for anger. Here, each time you deal with it, with this very powerful intelligence of dialogue with the emotions, you're actually eroding the tendency. And at some point, you will be less likely to become angry. It will be more difficult to make you angry. And you can imagine some time where at least hatred the wish to willingly harm terribly someone else could be completely gone from your mind. And that would be, could be a result of mind training. Definitely, we can in enhance our compassion and so forth. So it is something that's highly desirable in our life. It's not just a luxury. It's not just a supplementary sort of diet or vitamin of the soul. It's something that's really at the heart of every moment that we go by. It's something that also, with time, we can see in ourselves that it really brings some change. And it really brings some more openness so that we have a more fulfilled life and we can put it at the service of others. Instead of the lose-lose situation of the seeking this selfish happiness and disconsidering others, where we feel miserable, we make others miserable. Here we have a win-win situation. Loving kindness and, and compassion are among the most positive of all positive emotions. And that's what we're going to show you just now. And also, of course, others will perceive it in a positive way. So I just want to show you very briefly, since we speak of changing, uh, changing your mind, changing your brain, uh, some, since f f some years now, we have been collaborating with neuroscientists this is an endeavor that has, was started by Senator Dalai Lama, or inspired by him, into studying the influence on the brain of uh, sustained mind training. And uh, the idea was people who have, so for instance, a concert violinist has done at least 10,000 hours of violin. And there is some areas in the brain which have changed. The area that deals with the fingers, with the motor coordination, and all kinds of things, it has vastly increased in activity, even in size. So what happens, not if you learn just the piano, but if you learn compassion, if you train in vigilance, in attention, will that change the brain too? If that does, it means that meditation is not just blissing out for a few moments under a mango tree and try to empty your mind unsuccessfully, but it is really a deep change that comes through mind training. 
So that was a very interesting sort of approach. So we needed to start with experienced meditators, because you know, if there's a, a noticeable difference in them, then we can know, see, you know how do they, you reach there and start with novices. If there was no difference in those experts, then don't expect to find one after one week. So here is the place where they came from. And uh, well, it's almost as nice in, in the Google campus, but, <laughs> but it's still easier to meditate there than on the, in the subway. But we, we can soon have a, a Google campus in Tibet or somewhere. And I'm sure Meng will be very happy to, to be a, a star one on top of Everest without oxygen. And uh, so those are the beautiful places where they come from. And uh, well, this was in Eastern Tibet, the August 1st, the hottest day of the year. And the night before, we were camping and with Tibetan friends. And we have a quite large tent. And they, they were snowing at, at, at dusk. And they said, they said, we are going to sleep outside. I said, I said, why? We have a big tent. They said, yes, it's summertime. <laughs> so they slept outside. In the morning, there was 10 <laughs> centimeters of snow on their, on their clothes. So this is what I'm fortunate to see from the window of my small hermitage in the Himalayas. So I can't complain. And this is the example of a, what a spiritual teacher sees. And you can see that there's some kind of beyond world, a kind of human quality that we sort of can't miss. And in reality, it was certainly very strong. It's almost like human goodness becoming palpable. That's what Paul Ekman, I think you are going to receive soon, one of the world's specials of emotions. That's how he described you know, an encounter with the Dalai Lama. There's something that you almost physically, not a, well, not of these weird vibes, but something that's so sort of natural and simple, and yet something that you can really feel. A kind of strength mixed with goodness and a sort of solidity, but uh, at the same time sensitivity. I mean, it's very hard to describe, but it's really what makes an extraordinarily good human being. And this cat is certainly one of the uh, fortunate ones. <laughs> and this is my first teacher, Kanjur Rinpoche. And, and then, yes, this is a hermit who comes out of six years of meditation in the hermitage. So the question is, is he so happy because finally he's coming out, <laughs> or, because he, or because he did six years of meditation? And knowing him well, I, I would favor the second hypothesis that he's something that he acquired to his training. So not in Madison, Wisconsin, now the meditators have 256 electrodes. And there are two ways of measuring brain activities. One is to uh, electroencephalogram. That is a very good time resolution. A thousandth of a second change can be recorded on the scalp. But not so clear exactly where it happens in the brain. So we have to combine that with fMRI, which is magnetic resonance, the scanner which is a very good three-dimensional analysis of where things happening in the brain. There's brain imaging, but not so good in time-wise. The resolution is one or two seconds. So it's like a camera in the first case that is very fast shutter speed, but not so well focused. Second case is very well focused, but slow shutter speed. But if you combine both, you get both spatial and time temporal resolution. So that's after coming out of two and a half hours in the scanner. So the huge relief from that mini retreat. And this is, <laughs> this is Richard Davidson, the, the lead scientist in, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. And there are other labs who now doing this uh, uh, study in Princeton and Harvard and Berkeley, not so far from here, and more and more interest. So there are many st states that you can study, because meditation is very varied. So there are, you can study focused attention, mental imagery or visualization, you can study compassion, and that's one of the one we have studied most. And each of these has a different brain signature. So compassion here is, a, I mean, I'll spare you all the, the reading that, but is the unconditional feeling of, of love that begins with an object, but then becomes more and more universal to all sentient beings. And it's a very powerful and strong feeling of loving kindness. So this is the first paper we published in the PNAS. And then now the, the actual first results. So now what we need is to compare things. We need to compare a meditator at rest and in meditation. We also need to compare meditators with control group, those who are novice in meditation, and see if there's a difference. So we give the instructions of, to them, same instruction that meditators use for many years, and ask them to do it for a week and come back to the lab. And then in the lab, what we do is a minute of rest, three minutes of intense 
getting into a state of, of compassion or focused attention, whatever the subject is, and then doing that again and again 30, 40 times, in, out, in, out, and measuring changes. We did that with the expert mediators, we did that with the controls. In case of the control, the green line is the resting state. The blue line is also the meditation state. They try, they feel something, but it's not strong enough to elicit a strong response in the brain. Here you see with the meditators, the, the rest line is the same, but now when they engage in compassion meditation, there's a huge increase, 1,200% of the brain waves, particularly in the gamma range, which is connected with the connections in the brain and so forth. And it does happen also, interestingly enough, mostly in the area of the brain, which is the left prefrontal cortex, which has to do with positive emotions. So compassion is among the most powerful positive emotions. And just to give you an idea, this is a huge increase. Uh, maybe there's something big happening in the brain if you're about to be run over by an elephant. But to go from a resting state and in 15 seconds voluntarily bring a powerful mental state that's never been recorded like that in neuroscience. So even the, everyone's starting to doubt, is it an artifact or something? So it took almost a year to make sure that this was really the result of meditation and not just something else. And this is just a different way of, of showing or displaying the same result. Another way, here are the controls, here are the meditators. It's very, very different. And we also did real-time monitoring. When the compassion meditation sort of takes off, increases, then the meditator will just have a small keyboard and with the right and left arrows, he will go, come up. One, two, three, four, five. Then if you prolong that, after some minutes, he might start losing it a little bit. So we, he will go down. He's not going to look at the numbers, not to be influenced, but he is just changing the keys. And then he will come down, maybe three, four, three, two, and then he brings it back strongly again, so he will go up. So this ups and downs turns out to be very closely related to what is actually measured in the brain. It's 0 0.69 correlation. If some, if some of you are statisticians, you know, it's a, it's, there's a chance of one in a 40 million time that this is just random or due to chance. And this is now the, the brain imaging. And here, when they meet on compassion, the area that is vastly activated is this left prefrontal cortex, which has to do with positive emotion, joy, sense of enthusiasm. So compassion is, in itself, a most powerful emotion. Now, interestingly enough, too, the blue signifies a decrease of activity. And that area of the right prefrontal cortex is normally associated with depression, rumination, excessive self-concern, negative effects. So here, it seems that compassion is almost an, as an antidote to depression, which is, of course, a fascinating avenue of research. Now, uh, now also this aspiration to relieve suffering that comes with compassion strongly reduces the activity in the amygdala, which is known to be connected with fear and anger. So again, compassion reduces that. It also increases activity in, in the motor area of the brain. That means compassion comes with the readiness to act, of course, for the benefit of others. So now attention. Normally, if you have to maintain your attention very sharply, you start losing it out of fatigue. You know, it's the problem of air traffic controllers, for instance. And if you have tests where you task, where you see flashing numbers very fast, and each time there's a zero, you have to press a button, after five, 10 minutes, we start making more and more and more mistakes, and your score goes down, which is happening here. But with meditators, after 10 minutes, there's no change, and now we did that for 60 minutes, absolutely no change. Two errors in 1,000 trials, and they don't report to be tired, just like a set of flow. It's, this is precisely what a skill is about. It's, you do it naturally, perfectly, without being tired. But you know, this fly in the face of so much assumptions William James, the founder of modern psychology, said that no one can maintain their attention more than a few seconds on a given object. So that seems to be quite different here. And this, those are areas of the brain which are activated in the meditators when they perform those attention tasks and compared to the controls that just cannot do it that much. So now what about short-term training? You say, well, it's great for you to be in the Himalayas for 20 years. <laughs> what about us? You know? We can go to the swimming pool, yes. There's, there's a coffee shop every 100 feet, yes, that's quite good. But 
what about meditation, which, which our dear friend is uh, trying to bring to you as a boon, an, ex an extra boon in, in, in Google. What if we do 30 minutes a day for a few months? Well, that's exactly what was done in a very highly stressed employees of a biotech company in Madison. They volunteered to do 30 minutes a day for, for three months. And there was a control group. We said, oh, we'll give you the training after, but please come to the lab every week. So then the measurements were done before and after. So this on, on trait of anxiety, there's a, a, whole, a, a bunch of questionnaires and analyses that determine your level of anxiety. You can see here, time one, the control group and the meditators or the apprentice meditators, no difference. And there was a significant difference just after three months. Now the left, I mentioned about this right and left side activation of the brain, more positive effect on one side, more negative ones. As you can see here at time two, which I don't know why it says three here, the, the meditators are much more activate on the, left, on the left side. And surprisingly, the control group was even negatively activated because you know, it's kind of boring. They have to come to the lab without doing the meditation. So they're actually a little bit upset at the end of those three months. <laughs> but later, they, they went to the training, don't we? Now, though, interestingly enough, the immune system also is boosted. And significantly, you know, to, not to miss work, they have to get a compulsory flu shot in November so that they, they, don't, do a, they, don't, they don't skip coming working. So now, uh, when you give a vaccine, whether it will work or not depends upon the strength of your immune system. You know, in the first Iraq war, a, a vaccine that normally will take 80% cases because the soldiers that were going to the war were so stressed, it would only take 50%. So your level of stress decreases the effectiveness of the vaccine. So here, after those who have gone through these three months of 30 minutes of their meditation, their immune response was boosted 20%. So that also means the same strength also to fight actually natural flu and other diseases related to stress. And now the stress level, which measure with cortisol in the saliva, in all the meditators is four times less than in the control group. Well, that's not with the novice meditator, that's with the people doing long retreats. So there's definitely an effect in those preliminary studies, even for short term. I mean, not short term, but a short amount of time every day already in three months show a significant effect. And then maybe next year, something that might make the you know, big time sort of news, we are now studying the aging process, which is, has to do, some of you might know, at the end of the DNA, the chromosome, there are three, uh, what you call a telomere. It's a single branded DNA, and it's shortened with age. Now, it seems the preliminary result. Now, I'll, I'll tell you just between you and me. <laughs> After three months of intensive meditation, that's not 30 minutes a day, that's more like a, in, a, in a meditation sort of workshop for three months, a significant uh, decrease of the, of the diminution of the telomere. So, wow, that will be big news, isn't it? Stay young, meditate. So now, to come back to the outer condition, which I mentioned in the beginning, now we often see people who are extremely rich, extremely powerful. On top of that, they might be strong and beautiful, and they are, you hear they are depressed and so forth. You say, what's wrong with this guy? If I had all that, I would be happy. Well, that's not the case. <laughs> of course, for money, which is one of the obvious candidates, if you are below the poverty line and can't feed your kids and suffer a terrible condition, yes, to go above that will make a huge difference in the quality of your life. But now, be, be, after that, behind that, then doubling, tripling, just doesn't make any difference. Here is the GDP in the United States, three times increase from 46 to 96. The gross national happiness, stationary, <coughs> even slight decrease. Now, marriage by your happiness, here you are. <laughs> Time zero, five years later. Well, you know, Richard Davidson, who gave me that slide, said, you know, I've been married happy for 30 years, but that's the, what has been came out of the study. <laughs> Yet, there's another data that shows it's still better, it's a happier reported life for people who are married or live in, in, in companionship rather than people who are single or separated. But relatively, the change of happiness, basically you come back where we were. And now widowhood, well, you recovered from it also. So 
external factors only have a limited effect on our level of happiness. They do have, but all together, if you bring all the social factors studied over thousands of studies over now 70 years, basically they contribute to something but only about 15% of your reported happiness. People differ in their emotional disposition or affective style, and though these conditions are relatively stable, you know, if you win the lottery, you are, you are completely happy. One year later, you more or less come back to the same level. They can be changed. That's the point. Meditation has demonstrable effects on the brain and may represent one of the few ways in which purely mental training has been demonstrated to have robust impact on brain function. And this is a meditator, and this is the monks escaping from the lab. <laughs> so now, here you might say, well, there's a contradiction here. You say that happiness can be trained, and we just show that you know before after marriage, before after widowhood, money doesn't make any difference. So then what? If it's that stable, what's the point of meditating? You're going to make just another of those small peaks and come down. So what's the point? Well, remember what I mentioned at the beginning. Genuine happiness as a way of being is not the peaks of joy and pleasant and then the, the lows of depression and so forth. This is the ups and down. But when you go up and down, you go up and down above and below a baseline. So here, mindfulness, I mean, the, the meditation and mind training is raising the baseline, the platform in which you stand in life, the place where you come back. Those, those ups and downs is going to happen. Maybe you'll be less vulnerable to them, less carried away by them, less affected or impacted by them so that you maintain this sense of direction, of meaning in life. But you can change that. And so that's a really worth it endeavor in life. And also, to get the inspiration to do that, we need to identify some kind of potential that we have within ourselves. We need to, at some point, sit quietly and say, what really matters for me in life? What do I really want to accomplish in life? Not just you know, filling questionnaires and uh, after you pass some tests and things like that, and then putting that in the, in the machine or in the, in the computer or going to a professional orientation, and then, you know, OK, you have this, 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 that. That's what, that's what you are good for. But really feel what deeply you would like to spend your life, so that 20 years later, when you look back, you say, you know, I did my best. That's what I wanted to do. I have a sense of fulfillment, of accomplishment. That's otherwise, you know, what's the point? Even you succeeded in this, 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 that, and you feel not so, you know, there's some sense of accomplishment that's not there, some sense of fulfillment that was worth it to live in that way. That's what we want. So I think it's so important to identify within ourselves what really matters, and then find a way. Let's always find a way to accomplish it. So I think this, if meditation could be as a mind training, not taking the exotic aspect or oriental aspect of it, just it could become a genuine contribution to a more open, compassionate society and also to the quality of our life. So thank you for your attention. You might have some questions. I think we have time for some questions. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you very much. That was fascinating. I'm just curious, with the power of meditation to change some of the, the brain, the way the behavior, for children now with Asperger's, where there's some brain dysfunction, have you heard about any research in that? Well, you know, all this is quite preliminary. There, there has been some, well, we have formed a subgroup on education. In this, uh, you know, this is spearheaded by the Mind and Life Institute, which doesn't do research, but sort of bring together all these people. And we have a, you know, a strong sort of, since last year, we're really taking, trying to uh, study education, not only from educators and social, but bringing together psychologists, uh, educators, social workers, neuroscientists, and contemplatives. And I think that's one of the first time that this happened in, at the very good level of science and contemplation. So there have been, uh, obvious ideas of doing with uh, children which uh, have attention deficit. And, uh, you know, so this is a really beginning uh, approach. But that's, that's part of the what we really would like to contribute, more like a secular approach to those things, not just the Buddhist label, 
it's nothing wrong with the Buddhist label, but it might you know, look too much like a religious approach and that then deprive the, the, the tools for actually serving society in a deeper way. So I have a friend of mine in France who started that in his school. He called that secular training to attention. It looks very good, and everybody's happy about that. Mm -hmm. So well, I think this is the way to go, yes. Mm. And so you said it was the Heart Mind Institute that they no, were doing? The, no, the Mind and Life mind Institute. And life. There's okay. a website. Right, yeah. thank you. Hi, I keep hearing the number 10,000 in ten, tens of thousands of hours of training. And, and it's, uh, it's really cool to see the fMRI um, effects of, of meditation. But I'm also curious if there have been advances in training so that random people who can't go to the Himalayas for 20 years. Yes, um, that's, that's exactly you know, why we did the, a, mm. a simpler biofeedback kind of thing where, where people can recognize yeah. the state, I mean, the, like the, the monk who was, who was pressing the keys on the keyboard. Yes. He knew what he was feeling. We have been taking our feedback. And you know, when we start to be hooked on, the, on, the, on, the, on this electroencephalogram, and we can look, and you, know, you can start generating compassion, and you see those gamma waves going, Bzz, it's kind of fun. But at the same time, you know, it's a little bit interfering. You, 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 suppose I, I see myself in my hermitage trying to meditate. I, I don't want to watch a screen and, and brain waves. And this is electrode E25. I know I'm trying to make it, psh, let's go up. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is more like a distraction. Uh, but, um, but I think, again, to the, the 10,000 hours argument, is, that's why we do now longitudinal studies. And, and our goal is, if there are robust results, there was one groundbreaking paper in PNAS two years ago. Now, there's three more coming this year, which will really establish that contemplative neuroscience field, maybe better. But the real goal is once the, there's been robust study with the expert meditators, it's really to go to you know, everyone. Otherwise, there's no, it's just a curiosity. Uh, but if it really applies and you're in a biotech company, you know, certainly it can apply here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm wondering, so when you're an expert meditator, you have a, a, an average level of happiness that is higher than otherwise. What if you stop meditating? How long does it take to go down? Is it yes. something that lasts for long, ever, or not at all? Well, you know, the idea of stopping meditating for 20 years to see how <laughs> terribly miserable <laughs> I will become, that's not exactly... <laughs> I mean, we need a very determined volunteers. You know, the, it's like but a kami, it's, but, it's like the kamikaze of happiness. But, but <laughs> <laughs> so that becomes like a medicine that you have to take forever. No, no. Well, I think you know there are things like skiing. You know, I've been skied for 35 years, and I could show you a photo last year. It was a joy after two hours to be able to ski as before. So there are, I think, I think there are there is something that's so deeply changed that it certainly remains as a way. That's the point of a way of being, of a baseline. It takes time to acquire it, but because of that, it has a really strong and firm foundation. I'm really convinced of that. And actually, that's the real test. We say, no, it's fine if the meditators are sitting in the sun, basking in the sun with full belly. No problem. Meditation is always good. But then confronted with adverse circumstances, that's where he or she is put on the scales. And I think that's where, in daily life, you can see. And what we need is slow change. You know, the fireworks of mystical experiences don't last. But it's like the harm of a clock. When you, do, when you stare at it, it seems not moving. But when you look from time to time, it has changed. So those changes are slow, hence the need for mind training. But because they are slow, they are much more likely to be stable. And that's the idea. You know, the brain won't degenerate too quickly, hopefully. And then your experience also. I think it's something that, at some point, there's a kind of, of sort of a no return point in, in this kind of uh, baseline. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your attention.